this is Mike Check 95 and before we get into the review, be sure to like, share, subscribe, tell your friends about us, join the Discord, join the madness. That is Mike Check Productions. The review that we're going to be covering today is the continuation of the Spider-Man series. It is the beginning of the Tom Holland Spider-Man film, Spider-Man Homecoming. Established as a superhero, Spider-Man must battle with the teenage issues of having a crush and all the other fun lovey-dovey stuff with a high school student, while also protecting the city from the villain Vulture. Critics rate this film a 9.2 out of 10, while audiences rate this film an 8.7. The budget of this film is $175 million, and they boxed off its back $880.2 million. Now, before we get into our actual thoughts, time to go through some goofs and trivia. Goofs! Um, the top of the uh, Washington Monument was missing a lightning rod. The Lego Death Star set in the film is actually the 2008 edition without the figures, not the 2016 edition with figures. And the third goof that I have right here is the robbery scene where all the robbers are wearing Avengers masks. The robber with the Thor mask has a helmet, which is never seen on Thor ever in the MCU. Uh, trivia! Aaron Davis in the film, played by um, Childish Gambino, says he has a nephew in the film which in the Ultimate Universe, Aaron Davis is the Prowler, and his nephew is Miles Morales. Peter's homemade costume has a lot of similarities, if not very similar, to Ben Reilly's first Spider-Man suit. And, the entirety of this whole film here, Spider-Man doesn't punch a single enemy. Going into my pros, cons, and comments, um, I actually haven't seen this film since, uh... It was in theaters, and then I watched it again for the first time on DVD. Of course, the first few minutes of this film are set right after the events of the first Avengers film, and the bits that are filmed by Peter Parker are actually set during the events of Civil War, during the massive huge fight scene at the airport. This film has a kind of a vibe of like a Spider-Man Year One, kind of like how people like to uh, talk about Batman Year One with the 2022 Batman film. And Michael Keaton plays the villain Vulture. He has a tendency to play flying creatures. I think Michael Keaton is trying to tell us that he wants to fly. Alright, so time to get into some pros of this film. Uh, my first pro is obviously Michael Keaton. He does a fantastic job as Vulture. Portrays him very well for the uh, MCU version of him. The version of him in the MCU ties it in very well with the rest of the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe and into this film. Make you kind of realize why he's doing what he's doing what led him to that path of evilry and why sometimes you kind of feel bad for the guy even though he's doing very horrible things like vaporizing Discount Tom Hardy. Speaking of that, Discount Tom Hardy is my other pro. I forget his name all the time and he's not in too many films I've seen but I tend to like this actor a lot. He does a pretty good job in some of the films that I've watched him in. Vulture's Origin. I talked about this when I brought up Michael Keaton how he does a really fantastic job and like it's just the writing is done so well and it ties in together very fluidly. Okay, my next pro in the film would have to be Tom Holland's portrayal as Peter Parker in Spider-Man itself. Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker. It was a little bit awkward but it actually kind of worked out for portraying like an uh, awkward nerdy kid in high school even though he looked like he was about 20 years older than an actual high school student. And his Spider-Man was okay, not to knock on it too much, but you can still kind of sense that awkwardness here and there, kind of bleeding into from the Parker side. Whereas Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker was very edgy, very cool, very, oh yes, I'm a skateboard, put he uh, headphones in, and have thumb holes in the sleeves of my jacket. And his Spider-Man was also edgy and cool, but it worked out because... Spider-Man's cocky, he's arrogant. Holland actually kind of got that perfect blend in the middle. You got the awkward teen, you got the goofiness, you got the nerdiness of Peter Parker, and you got the quirks, the arrogance, the cockiness of Spider-Man, and I feel like Holland actually nailed that one on the head, and this is kind of like the Spider-Man that a lot of people were looking for when it came to on-screen portrayals. So Tom Holland did a fantastic job. Spider-Man. Mary Jane in this film. To be quite honest, throughout this series, um, I was a little iffy about uh, Mary Jane while watching this film in theaters for the first time, but as I went to go watch uh, Far From Home, and then I'll end up watching No Way Home, her character actually kind of grew onto me and everything, just because of what 
like Disney and Marvel did for like a choice and whatnot to play Mary Jane. But watching this again, she's actually really good in the film and that I feel like people kind of like ragged on it a little too much when it first came out. It, it was just, she did a really great job and I enjoyed her as uh, Mary Jane Watson in this film. Um, expressions with his eyes. They did it for the first time and Captain America Civil War showing it, but it was more seen in this film a lot, and I actually liked it. This was kind of the first time in a Spider-Man standalone film itself where they actually showed that his eyes were uh, showing expressions that are getting wide and like shrinking down when he was like shocked or like trying to like zone in on something. The robbery scene kind of goes into like all the action scenes in this film and the quirkiness. Uh, I, I loved it a lot and everything, and it like showed his actual Spider-Man character in action after doing some little things here and there in the beginning. Um, a lot of entertainment, a lot of funniness, a lot of action, a lot of explosions. It was great, like, introduction, first big fight scene in a in this Spider-Man film. I liked the fact that they only mentioned but didn't show Uncle Ben's death on screen. Like, it was not that I say, like, they should completely ignore that story arc, but, like, what they did in the film where they're like, oh, well, like, you know what Aunt May's gone through and everything. Like, I don't want to, like, worry her any more than what she has been. I'm glad they didn't show it on screen again like they did with Amazing Spider-Man and the... For example, the four or five thousand times that they've showed Batman's parents' death and they finally turned that around and didn't do it in the 2022 Batman film. But just the fact that they just mentioned it was a great um, choice. This next pro here is kind of like one of those blink and you'll miss it kind of moments, but it's right after um, Vulture like grabs Spider-Man and take, lifts him up in the air for the first time and then he drops him down in the lake or whatever. And if you look in the background as uh, Spider-Man's falling back to the earth before he like, or releases his parachute or whatever, and if you look in the moon in the background, you can see the silhouette of the Vulture inside of the moon. And it gave me a lot of resemblance to the 1989 Batman where the Batwing shoots up from the clouds and it like shines itself in the middle of the moon like an actual bat uh, signal and everything and that I feel like that's what, what the purpose was and it was a really good callback to that. Spider-Man's dialogue with Karen or her, like his uh, AI uh, robot companion, he was quite hilarious. I enjoyed it a lot in this movie. Kind of gives him like that second person to talk to. He gets to like conversate and bicker and kind of share like his thoughts with somebody while he's like alone or like on missions just kind of like just give the kid someone to talk to if he's lonely or if he's like trying to pass the time while he's trying to get to one de from point A to point B reaching to his destination. I remember the first time I saw this in theaters I mean it was kind of a little bit of a given when they after the Washington Monument scene but I enjoyed the plot twist where Peter finds out that his crush's uh, dad is the vulture and then the vulture eventually finds out who Peter Parker is by putting two and two together and there's a scene at the part where he's taking uh, Liz and Parker to homecoming and he p makes the connection in his head and like the stoplight turns green and the green like lights up on his face from like the window on the outside and it's like showing us on screen that like a filming uh, technique that he figured it out right then and there, like, ah, like a light bulb. I actually really liked that technique right there. The fight on the uh, invisible jet and the last final fight scene, fantastic and, and everything, and the fact that it showed that even though that he was trying to stop the vulture, he does not want to kill him. He ends up saving him through all that. And at the very end, where Matt Gargan was like, oh, I think I heard that you guy, you know who Spider-Man is. And... I think it's kind of cool how uh, Vulture doesn't tell him who Spider-Man is, and I kind of think he doesn't tell him because he's trying to, I guess, protect him because he uh, saved his life, I guess, or whatever, I don't know, or just knows that he's a kid. Just the fact that with that final fight scene and how he saved his life and how, in return, uh, Adrian Toomes protected his identity from another villain that we could possibly see in the future. Um, some cons. Uh, I did not like the actor choice when it comes to Flash. Um, this one's been kind of hard to get right since the first Spider-Man film. This Flash, it's just, come on. Like, it's 
No, like, I don't like it at all. It's kind of garbage. Aunt May progressively gets younger per reboot. I don't know why they went for this method. I don't know why... I'm not saying that Aunt May's actress is bad. She's really good in the movie. It's just been kind of weird how in each reboot or each franchise she's gotten younger and younger by, like, 10 years or 20 years, and it's very interesting that they decided to do that. And the last con that I have is just kind of a nitpick. Um, the scene, or the multiple scenes where he's running over to where he's keeping his web fluid, and at the high school, he runes over and like lifts the entire like row of lockers to grab the web fluid that's underneath it and drops it down. It's kind of funny how he's able to hide it there. Which he probably does hide it there because he knows the layout of the whole high school. There's no cameras in that spot, and no one knows what he's doing. And if there were a camera there, his identity is, like, immediately, like, found out. It's just kind of weird how there's just no cameras in that one hallway. All in all, uh, basically, the only thing that I didn't really like was Flash and that weird nitpick with no cameras. This film was very fantastic, very great. Uh, it's a huge step up for the mishaps of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. So much good could have happened in that film so many wrong things that shouldn't have happened. This one brings us back to what Spider-Man should be, what fans want, what I wanted in the Spider-Man film, and I honestly enjoyed this film quite a bit. When it comes to my rating, though, I'm going to have to agree with the audiences but a little bit higher, and I'm going to give this film an 8.9. And I know that some, I know that there's probably some out there that are really like, well, why isn't it like a 9 out of 10? It's just mainly, like, I want to say that, for me, it's like the Flash actor kind of breaks it down a little bit. Um, the confusion of why Aunt May is 30, 40 years younger than she is in the original franchise. And just the no cameras. Like, it, it's, it's weird that there is no cameras in that one hallway. But an 8.9 is not a bad number at all. It's a great number, honestly. And that is my final rating for Spider-Man Homecoming. Now, the next time you shall see us, we're going to take a little break from Tom Holland's Spider-Man films and jump into the other film franchise that I included into the Spider-Man series because he's tied into the Spider-Man uh, lore and everything. And that will be the first Tom Hardy film of Venom. But until then, it's my Check 95. Something out.